Welcome to Sleepless in St. Canard, where the nostalgia replaces REM cycles. I'm Kitty. And I'm Ange. But we haven't slept. In 31 years, technically. Oh my. This is a podcast about the 90s classic cartoon Darkwing Duck, but it's also about the more recent comic series about the 90s classic cartoon Darkwing Duck. Today's episode marks the beginning of the Ange Tells Me a Story series about the comic misadventures of the Masked Mallard. As it's already been mentioned a few times, but just to reiterate, I have not read the comics. So I am but a babe in these woods of splash pages and plot holes. So no prior knowledge of the comics is necessary if you haven't read them. And I implore you to stick it out and experience them in the way nature intended as a Cliff Notes version told by Ange. Beautiful. I, I, I'm sure it will be. And... Um, just in the brief time that we had spoken before recording, I've already had my mind blown a few times just by you telling me what's not even in this episode yet, but what we'll get to <laughs> next. So I feel like I'm just going to be sighing heavily. You are. You are going to be. I know you will. I actually, in the script for this, like, because I wrote out a summary, I put parts of it where I just wrote, silence so that kitty can sigh. <laughs> Because I know, I know you. <laughs> so, Ange has compiled quite an extensive document of notes for herself today so that she can regale me with what passes as comic books these days. Ah, <laughs> uh, yes. So, the itinerary, what, what's on the menu today for y- y'all? Because I feel that this is going to be way too much to cover in just one episode. So this is going to be split up probably two or three different segments. This first segment, I'm going to do a very brief background about my history with the comics. Because I feel like my experience is slightly different compared to a lot of people. And I'll get into why. And then I will talk about the first four arcs. There's several arcs of the Boom Studios run of the Darkwing Duck comics. I promise you, Kitty, by the time we get to the end of this, neither one of us will have the emotional capacity to talk about (laughs) Dangerous Currency. You need to be on full battery to talk about Dangerous Currency. I just, yes. So I'll I'll clear my schedule next time we record so that I have full battery. Depending on how long Dangerous Currency takes, I'll probably also discuss the annual, which is the Quacker Jack story called Toy With Me, and also the untimely terror of the Time Turtle. I'm Turtle? Time Turtle. Okay. I'm already invested, but I know it's not going to pay off. I'm (laughs) The Time Turtle, in my mind, is a very tiny turtle with a stopwatch way too big for it how does he carry it around i don't know but he loves to know what time it is <laughs> oh, so so kitty we've already discussed <laughs> in the last episode that you said you remember vaguely reading maybe one issue and all you remember is that Bushroot's eyes were miscolored is that correct yes his eyes were green and darkwing worked in a cubicle Okay, so that would probably be the first issue of the entire series. First or second. I tapped out real fast. (laughs) (laughs) Drag me back in, and Drag me back in. So why don't you just lay it on us? Okay, before we we dive into that, I need to tell you about the before times. The before times... (laughs) Is what I say the timeline is before the DuckTales reboot, because the DuckTales reboot basically brought in a whole new generation of Darkwing Duck fans and brought in a lot of life to the fandom at large. But let me take you back in time, my friends. I need you to understand what it was like being a Darkwing Duck fan in 2009. And Kitty would know, too. This would be where the time turtle would come in and put this little stopwatch. <laughs> yes. So back in 2009, being a Darkwing Duck fan meant being permanently resigned to the idea that Disney had forgotten about him completely. We did get the DVDs released in 2006 and 2007, but they were very bare bones and the audio quality wasn't that great on them either. And other than that, 
It felt like Darkwing Duck and the rest of the Disney afternoon was a basically a shared fever dream of millennials because I'm telling you, it was like Disney never, ever brought up Darkwing again after the show ended in 1992. It was really bizarre. So when you were a fan, basically, you just had to kind of accept that we would never hear from him again. And we had to make up our own stories and our own characters. And also, it's like any time there was any even scrap of merchandise where it's like a badly miscolored shirt at Target or a random mug that the Disney store released. It was like, oh my God, I remember. Yeah, it this was. Is it, guys. <laughs> yeah, it was like. Everybody go. And, and we had all just like accepted that. Like that was just what it meant to be a Darkwing Duck fan. But then, let me tell you, my friends, on March 13th, 2010, news hit the internet that a four part mini series was being released by Boom Studios. And the announcement had originally been made that day by Aaron Sparrow at Emerald City Comic Con. And I can't remember, Kitty, if I spoke to you about it, but I lost my mind. I had a full-blown meltdown. I remember getting super emotional. I just couldn't believe it was happening, that we were getting a new story. I even went back and I found some of the news articles from that time. And the information we had been given at the time was that the story would be written by someone named Ian Brill. The artist would be someone named James Silvani. And all they had told us is that there was a bunch of big changes that had come to St. Canard since we lost, saw the entire cast. Oh, is a good way to start. Yes. And then let me tell you something else that just like full on, you know, I'm a Negaduck fan. So it was either at the same time they announced this or shortly afterwards, but they posted a couple of the comic book covers. And I very clearly remember, and I know because I went back and I still have the, the cover, it was a cover with Darkwing Duck tied up and he's being dangled over a vat of acid and there's silhouettes of Steelbeak, Quackerjack, Megavolt, and Liquidator in the background. But even more confusing is that Negaduck's silhouette was also with them. But at the top of the cover, Negaduck's hand is holding a pair of scissors like he's getting ready to cut the rope. <laughs> so, okay, and then on top of that, Negaduck's hand was wearing one of those, like, cartoon white gloves like Mickey Mouse would wear. And oh, his cool. feathers were exposed and they were pitch black, like the Negatron galvanized Negaduck. Oh. But he was wearing the yellow, he had a yellow sleeve. Interesting. So I was freaking out because I was like, what did they do? Like, did they merge the two, <laughs> like the galvanized Negaduck and the regular, like, Negaverse Negaduck? Like, what did they do? And I was just like, I remember I was devising all these theories. And then it turned out it was just a miscolor. <laughs> <laughs> and when they actually released the the official because it, it was labeled as not final art and when they released the official cover for the first issue they had pretty much redrawn the whole thing uh oh yeah there was also a bunch of guns pointed at darkwing so they had made the, the guns more cartoony and less threatening probably because of the disney editors mm. and they had removed Negaduck and Steelbeak silhouettes from the background, so it was just the Fearsome Four who had all been redrawn, and then it was Negaverse Negaduck's hand that was cutting the rope. Gotcha. So, literally, it turned out to be nothing. It was just, I don't know, I guess they were still figuring things out when they were working on the comics and they didn't have enough information. I do remember when I spoke to James Silvani... At one point in time, I think he told me he was not provided any real reference to work with for any of the characters. So he had to work off probably a lot of like blurry screen caps and whatever. So that's probably part of it. And that also might be why Bushroot had green eyes. Yes. I, yeah. I mean, it's completely understandable that a normal person wouldn't know what color Bushroot's eyes are. But as he's one of the very few characters in the show that actually do have an eye color it would annoy me <laughs> what is his color because i could swear it changes slightly in different episodes it, it very well could i'm i am no expert of a shoot i but. usually pick purple because it was purple in beauty and the beat but i'm pretty sure there's other episodes where it's different colors 
I just can't oh. remember which ones. Here we go. After Bushroot fans time. who know him, top to bottom, weigh in. Weigh in, guys. Tell me what percentage of the time... No, just... That's fine. Just just tell me. One color, and then you can all battle to the death. But by death, I mean have a nice dinner. So, once again, before we can completely get into this, I need to, again, give you a little more information about my background. So, like I said before, I had an interesting relationship with the comics because, like I said, I freaked out. I immediately opened up a WordPress blog on my website so that I could do reviews when the comics came out. The comics, I believe, let's see here, I have the dates. Okay, yes. So March 13th, 2010, they announced the comics and they were going to be released on in June of 2010. So I had plenty of time to make a website and I was going to report any news. And much to my surprise, only a month after they announced the comics, Boom Studios contacted me through email and they asked me if I wanted to be on their media list. I forget exactly what it was called, press release or something like that. But basically what it meant was that before the comics were officially released, I would be given a PDF copy to review, and then I could write mm -hmm. a non-spoiler review before the comic was released. Like an advanced reader's copy. Yes. And I mean, as just speaking as the fact that I was just a Darkwing Duck fan and a you know, I didn't have like an official news site. I wasn't an official reporter. Having that kind of access was a huge deal to me. I yeah, was it's just, pretty awesome. Yeah, like I was completely, I couldn't believe it. So by the time the first issue dropped, I already had access in advance to the copies of it. So I was reviewing it. Uh, I, and if you want to read the reviews, because I still have them up on the internet, you can read them as they were, like a time capsule. You just go on over to negaverse.net, and you look under the comic section, and I think it's labeled under the Duck Knight Returns. And if you click that, I have all my old reviews that were written back then, and you can go through and you can look at all of the reviews. So, there you go. A pause now. Read them all. And then pretend like you didn't read them and then come back and listen to Anne to tell you about them. Yes. And then additional to that, so the comics dropped in June. And then by October, I decided to go to New York Comic Con that year where the entire crew for the comics was going to be signing comics. So it was, you know, James Salvani, Ian Brill, all those people. And at the time... There was a Twitter account that they were running pretending to be Darkwing. It was it was something like The Real Darkwing. And he was it was like an in-character Darkwing who would advertise the comics. And I later found out that it was a combination of, I think, Ian Brill and Aaron Sparrow that were running the account. And I had made an account as a joke for Negaduck uh, called Negzy. And I started trolling the Darkwing Duck account. And much to my surprise, he started interacting with me in character. And we kind of did like a back and forth for a while. So when I went to New York Comic Con and they were signing my stuff, I mentioned it to them. I said, you know, I'm the person on Twitter that's been running around as Negaduck. And they were completely floored because every single person there had been following the Negaduck account. And they thought it was somebody playing a prank on them. Mm -hmm. And I guess they weren't ready to see a seven foot tall Samus Aaron cosplayer. <laughs> I was dressed as zero suit Samus at the time. <laughs> you were. Being like, yeah, I'm the person playing Negaduck on the internet. <laughs> <laughs> but it caught their attention. And then I didn't know it at the time, but Aaron Sparrow was the one who had pitched the comics. And he was the original editor and writer of the comics but he got fired essentially from Boom pretty early when the comics started. So I think he's only credited as the editor for the Duck Knight Returns, which is the first four issues. So he wasn't present at the table signing with him, but I asked if he was around because I knew his name. And James, James kind of waved me over and he said, if you're looking for Aaron, he's just over there talking to some people. So I went over to Aaron and I introduced myself and we ended up talking for what must have been like two hours, uh, just about like the comics and 
his history of what had happened. And I won't get into his side of things just because I feel like that's his story to tell and not mine. But if you, I'm pretty sure if you just Google like Aaron Sparrow interview, he's done several interviews with various podcasts and probably other places too where he's talked about it. So if you want to hear his side of things, you can go look for it. I should also add, just because I think this is really funny, Kitty, I was looking up, you know, more of the history of the comics because, like, this was a while ago, right? I don't remember everything. So the Darkwing Duck wiki has a lot of the information. So I was going through it to, you know, make sure, double-check everything that I was following was correct. And, like, you know how the wikis, they have, like, they'll make a statement, like a factual statement, and then they'll have a source, and then you can yeah, click citations. it. Citations. Mm citations. -hmm. So I was going through it just to double check a few things. And I would click the citations. And the citations were me. I was the source. <laughs> <laughs> it was, it was, <laughs> it was, it was, it was like uh, they were cite citing either places like the old haunt forum where Aaron Sparrow had been on there but also I was on there too and also my Tumblr and various other places where I had brought up the comics and talked about them so they make these statements about stuff and one of the ones I remember that was like something about Negaduck and something that got removed from the story and the site like the source was me apparently and I was like it's probably true because I mean a lot of uh, what happened with the comics, I kind of got dragged into it a little bit. Like I was present and I witnessed a lot of like what went down. So yeah, it, it, that's what I mean when I say that my relationship with the comics is a little weird because there is a definite bias there as well. But let's actually get to the comics themselves, my friends. We got Angie on the inside of this of this whole thing, but also I would just like to say that um, I was also uh, next standing next to Samus in Samus Ange in that moment, and I did not say anything to those Darkwing Duck people. <laughs> Were you there? Because my memory overwrote this, and I thought I was alone. I thought I I, I th was I was with you. Yeah, <laughs> I don't remember that. I'm so sorry. I think I left. I think I left because you were like gonna go talk to Aaron. I don't think I I was there for that, but I definitely got a comic book signed by somebody, and that's the one issue that I have. <laughs> I remember going with you in 2009, but for some reason in my head, I thought I went to 2010 alone, but. I always stay at your place when I go there, so that would make sense. I, can't, I don't know. You're not in my memory for this. That's okay. I, I was a bit part. I didn't really hang around. I was like, where are you going? All right, we'll meet up again. Uh, okay, let's get to the comics. So yes, there, we'll, we'll start with, I'll give you a rundown of the Boom Studios. There were a total of 18 issues. They were released between June 2010 and November 2011. And then there were also two extra issues. Actually, I might be counting a total of 18. It might technically be 16 because the two extra issues were the crossover with DuckTales. So they were DuckTales comics because Boom also had a DuckTales series at the same time. Oh. So there's five arcs. Each of them contains four issues. The first arc is The Duck Knight Returns. And it reintroduces us to St. Canard and all the changes that have occurred within. The next set, issues 5 to 8, is Crisis on Infinite Darkwings. And that is when we get the team-up between Negaduck and Magicka Dispel. And more Darkwings than you can shake a net at. Good times. And then we get, after that, issues 10 to 12? Is that right? 10, 11... 12. Why does it feel like it should be more? I click. Oh, 9 to 12 is what it should be. I don't know why. I miswrote that. But okay. So the next arc is Foul Disposition. And it brings back Steelbeak and it introduces a new character. And we'll get there because that's a thing. And then the second to last is Campaign Carnage, which was issues 13 to 16 and introduces a bunch of new villains and characters, and as the name suggests, there is an election. Uh, and then finally... Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> party. okay. Yeah. Then, I get it now. <laughs> and then finally, 
After that, there was the infamous DuckTales Darkwing Duck crossover known as Dangerous Currency, which has been struck from the record. Okay. Oh, yeah, and then there's the annual, which is those two stories I mentioned earlier. Okie dokie. Okay, we're going to start with The Duck Knight Returns, which is probably the first issue that you read but probably don't remember. Yeah, I, I, I vaguely remember some of the art. Um, I do remember that there was the parody cover that was the Dark Knight Returns, the Frank Miller yes. one with... Yes, it, it looks really cool. That I think was, that, was, that was very well done. I think that was a con exclusive issue. Yeah, it's it's very well done. I recommend a Google if you haven't seen it. Yes, uh, most of the covers there was usually about two or three per issue. They had variant covers, so if you wanted all the covers, you had to spend extra money to buy the same comic two or three times. Which I guess. Yeah, that, welcome to the comics industry. <laughs> Um, some of the art was really fantastic, though, for the, the covers. And if you do want to see the collection of the covers, once again, negaverse.net, the Duck Knight Returns <laughs> section. I'm pretty sure I compiled all the covers there if you want to go look at them. So we'll start off with issue one of the Duck Knight Returns. The writer for this was Ian Brill. The artist was James Silvani. The colorist was Andrew Dalhouse. The editor was Aaron Sparrow and the assistant editor was Chris Burns. But Aaron will later not be involved or mentioned in the credits. I think it's going to switch over eventually. I think it's Chris Burns becomes the editor, but we'll get there. So issue one, are you ready? Are you ready for this jelly? I'm ready. I am ready. The readiest for this jelliest. We open up with Drake Mallard and Launchpad McQuack at a Starducks where they're ordering a coffee. When all the lights go out, it turns out to be none other than Megavolt, who is holding a Starducks cup for some reason. And then we get a two-page spread of Darkwing Duck battling Megavolt, who's holding his little cup of Starducks. And Darkwing starts in on his I Am the Terror line, which is, I am the awkward goodbye that lasts for far too long. I am, and then it cuts to the Darkwing Duck logo, and it's like the title introduction to the series. It looks pretty nice. The art is fantastic. But on the next page, we realize that this isn't actually happening in present time. It's a news report discussing the one-year anniversary of the Starduck's caper, the last known adventure of St. Kennard's masked Avenger, Darkwing Duck. This, this is suspending the uh, my belief already because... Darkwing on the news. Someone is <laughs> remembering him. I don't know about this. <laughs> well, it goes on. The TV. It's a TV, and we see that we're in an office building, and there's a huge crowd of employees. And the news reporter goes on to insult Darkwing by saying that before the days of the Quackworks Corporation, Saint Kennard depended on an unlicensed vigilante with, at best, questionable taste in fashion. Mm, so that's a little more in character. Like they they get to insulting him. Yeah. And then we, we see Drake Mallard is among the people listening to the news report and he hears that and he's like, excuse me? And he rushes up to listen to the rest of it. And the reporter, Chip Dipson, who is apparently a stand-in reporter for Dip Dobson, goes on about how St. <laughs> Canard is way safer now that Quack works and their crime bots have cleaned up the city. Going to Tom Lockjaw. I think he actually, he appears, I think, later on as like one of the reporters at some point all right good then we get a uh, a bit of a joke that's obviously making fun of like office politics there's an announcement on the intercom that group 4 421 needs to go to floor 142 for a meeting at 241 and <laughs> darkwing or drake climbs 142 stairs and once he reaches the top the announcement says that the meeting is now on floor 241 and will start at 124 which was seven minutes ago that's a hell of a tall building it is very tall it's the tallest building in saint canard like when you look at the saint canard in the the cartoon it's like that center building okay i have a question is this drake mallard in a, in a sweater vest Yes, I think he was. Or I think it was okay. a sweater vest, but it was modified with an office theme. I, I literally read this <laughs> yesterday. I don't know why I can't remember this. I think it had like a bit of an office -y feel to it. He's just got like, don't talk to me until I've had my coffee pin on his chest. <laughs> so 
Drake ends up in a lecture hall type room with all the employees and we start getting a bunch of exposition about what's happened. And we find out that most of the employees working for this company called Quackworks are either former police officers who lost their jobs because they have crime bots, which are these robots that take care of all the crime. And also they took our gerbs. They took their gerbs. And also the former supervillains and criminals are also employees now. So they all work together. Um Okay. Yes. And this of course leads us to Drake is running his mouth off and shouting in the middle of the auditorium about how St. Canard is growing too dependent on the crime bots. And he keeps ranting for a bit, but they're interrupted by a receptionist who walks into the room and says that there is a phone call for Drake Mallard because his daughter has angered her principal again, as, is, as is tradition. Yeah, so Drake leaves in, you know, an embarrassed manner. He answers the phone, and this is where we learn that Goslin is now in a very expensive academy, complete with, like, a school uniform. And she has tied up the principal in his chair and she's telling Drake that she thinks the teachers are now working for supervillains and how her science teacher taught them how to freeze something instantly and break it just like the liquidator. Although I feel like that's more of an Isis Vanderchill thing yeah. than the liquidator, but whatever. Yeah. So Drake reminds her that there's no supervillains anymore because the crime bots took over and Drake now has a full-time job because he has to pay for Goslin's steep tuition. I guess he just didn't go the Morgana Macabre route. <laughs> I guess not. And I mean, it sounds a little bit like Goslin's needs some psychiatric help. <laughs> She's seeing villains everywhere. Yes. So we also learned Drake's official job title is a data accounts networking officer. And he, nobody, including Drake, knows what that actually means. That, does it, is it an acronym for something? Data accounts. Dano? What was it? Data accounts Dano? networking officer. Aw. I feel like they could have put a pun in there. You're gonna, anyway, you're, continue on. You're going to find out as we go through these comics, there was a lot of missed opportunities for puns and humor, and it just doesn't happen. I'm sorry to tell you. Uh, let me see if I can think up a good one to replace it. So, data... Hmm. <laughs> you're thinking... <laughs> Everything I, I can't. It's, it hurts. I could do it. Hold on. Data, uniform, networking, let's see, uh, communication expert, and it's dunce. <laughs> there we go. Kitty did hey, that in, <laughs> she did that in under 30 <laughs> seconds. Ian Brill, take notes, please. <laughs> you can, you can hear the smoke pouring out of my ears. Okay, so... so we get a lot of exposition in their discussion and Goslin says to Drake, what do you think Launchpad is doing right now? And Drake says, I don't know, dear. I don't know. So it sounds like Launchpad is no longer part of the family for some reason. Wow, things really went south for the Mallard Collective. Sure did. So Drake starts ranting about how there are still enemies around every corner, and he's overheard suddenly by his cubicle neighbor, who is none other than dot 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 Megavolt. Tom Lockjaw. Oh. <laughs> I remember we talked about this back in the day. Your first guess was that it was going to be her Muddlefoot. Oh, wouldn't it be great? <laughs> her would have been like employee of the month. And it would have driven Drake crazy. See, I'm writing a new one right now. I'm taking notes. <laughs> well, Elmo Sputterspark is still pretty funny because he's the cube mate of... Cubicle neighbor, cube mate, I don't know, of Drake. And Megavolt is wearing a yellow dress shirt with a blue tie that has what looks like little lightning bolts or waves on it. And he's wearing glasses that look identical to his goggles. Nice. And Megavolt starts ranting. He says, what do you, a common citizen, know about adventures? I once went ten rounds with Darkwing Duck in my quest to end the subjugation of crimping irons in this cruel city. And he's just, you know, continuously ranting. And then we get this funny scene where Megavolt says, you know, Mallard, you remind me of someone. 
Have you ever had the desire to go gallivanting through the night, ruining other people's fun? And then he gets up into Drake's face, and Drake's like, no. And Megavolt continues, did you ever think that a ridiculous purple getup would strike fear into St. Canard's handsomest and smartest criminals? And he's mushing his face into Drake's, and Drake's like, no. And then Megavolt continues, has it ever crossed your mind that gas guns and grappling hooks were the best way to enforce a trumped up and phony idea of justice? And Drake muffles like a, a sad no. And then mm. Megavolt just turns around and goes back to typing on his computer and says, very well then, I must have thought you were someone else. <laughs> <laughs> and Drake just looks really disheveled because like Megavolt was screaming in his face. Oh, or Drake. Yes, this whole first issue is honestly really depressing because coming up for the next few pages, we see you Drake. Know, nothing says like nothing <laughs> says rekindling nostalgia like super depressing takes on things. Yeah, and it just keeps getting worse. So for the next few pages, Drake is. I love the glee <laughs> in which you just said that. <laughs> Don't worry, it gets worse. Oh, good. <laughs> for the next few pages, Drake is at his boring desk job, but his mind keeps slipping back to memories of his time as Darkwing. So we get a few pages of Darkwing with his arm turned into a snake, and then a giant carrot was rampaging through St. Canard and has attracted the attention of the world's biggest rabbit. And then a memory of Launchpad uh, and Darkwing using the Shush time travel golf cart, and for some reason okay. the future has become Launchpad, where everybody has Launchpad's face, even the dogs. Uh, oh. It's very terrifying. There's even, like, a female jogger with, like, the feminine body with Launchpad's face, and it's really horrifying. <laughs> that, sounds, that sounds like a terrible future. Yes, and then another scene we have where Darkwing's left arm has been turned into Launchpad. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, it's spreading. <laughs> and, and so... If he has to clap, does he, does he like smash a snake and launch pad together? I don't know. I, th I thought you said if he has the clap, but you're saying if he has I to mean, I, I mean, I just assume he does. But... Okay, well, in between this, he's being yelled at by his boss and doing really boring mundane stuff. And he's been daydreaming so long that the day, the work day is over and his supervisor screams at him to get out because they don't pay him to daydream all day. And we just see Drake looking really like his soul has been broken. Like all his spirit is gone. He's sad. He gets on the public bus and he's looking really depressed. And he glances out the window and a motorcycle that looks kind of like the rat catcher drives past with a driver. And there's a guy shaped like launch pad in the sidecar. And Drake just kind of sighs sadly. If this was a cartoon right now, it would be a bummer mix of the theme song playing. <laughs> <laughs> it's like played on a recorder or something. Yeah, <laughs> a recorder. <laughs> And then we cut to Megavolk coming out and he's missed the bus, but suddenly a really shady red van drives past and he's pulled into it by a bunch of vines. And Megavolk screams, Edison's sake. <laughs> oh, Edison's sake. Yeah, there you go. Edison's sake. Um, so I have a question though. I, I know you can't answer it, but because Megavolt didn't lose his powers, so I, it just seems silly to me that he wouldn't just continue to skate on the power lines. It's never really explained. Everybody is just magically... I guess the idea is that the the crime bots are so efficient that all the villains gave up. Except for Bushroot, apparently. Bushroot's getting the bang... <laughs> the gan... The, wait, what am I trying to say? The band get back together. There we go. Words are hard. They are. So we, we go back to Drake. He's arrived home where Goslin and Honker are hanging out and Honker is on the computer for some reason. I don't know why he's there. Maybe the Muddlefoots are still trapped in the 90s and they don't have the internet. I mean, aren't we all on the computer all the time anyway? Yes, and we get this very depressing exchange between Goslin and Drake where Gos asks him what he even does at work and he just responds with, I don't know, Goslin. I don't know. And he just heads upstairs to his room. Oh, boy. And then we get a scene where he's... Hide all the knives. <laughs> we get a scene where he's, he's really depressed and he's sitting on his bed staring off into space. 
and he picks up the phone and he calls Launchpad. And Launchpad answers, but Drake doesn't say anything. He just listens to Launchpad's voice saying, you know. <laughs> breathes heavily into the phone. <laughs> He's just like listening while Launchpad's like, who's there? And then he hangs up. <laughs> After his finger was trembling as he did so. I think it was, actually. <laughs> All of a sudden, oh, the house starts to shake and rumble like there's an earthquake. And Drake says, not again. Which implies that this, something's happened. <laughs> so he rushes downstairs and the crime bots have busted through the wall to arrest Honker because he was downloading music illegally. And more oh specifically, he was downloading the song Your Love is Like Melting Butter by Hannah Alaska, which really dates this comic because at this time, Hannah Montana was all the rage. Uh-huh. So yeah, Hannah Alaska, not the most creative play. I feel like Hannah Moo Tana would be kind of funny, like a cow. Oh, yeah. Or <laughs> henna. Like henna moon t- mutana, and she could be a cow. kind of unholy <laughs> uh, uh, amalgamation of cow and chicken. Yes. See, see? We, we, got some, we got some good stuff going here already. <laughs> we could make monstrosities of nature as well. <laughs> so Honker is told he has to serve an indefinite period of time in the Quackworks detention camp and he gets carried away. Drake tries to fend them off but they electrocute him. So Drake is lying in the rubble and he says, I think I need to write a strongly worded memo tomorrow. But off screen Goslin says, you could do that. And then we see Goslin holding up the Darkwing Duck costume and she says, or you could let Darkwing Duck take care of this. And that ends the first issue. So this seems a bit like Bummerville for Drake because somebody got to be Dark Warrior Duck before he did. Something like that. Actually, wait, that's not the end of the issue. One last page is Megavolt is blindfolded and tied to a chair and he's very displeased. And then we see the silhouette of Quackerjack and he reaches over and he rips off Megavolt's blindfold to reveal the foursome... Uh, foursome. <laughs> the oh, <great. laughs> The Fearsome Four, with Quacker Jack saying it's time to get the band back together, which is quite literally what you said earlier. What I attempted to say, I eventually got it. (laughs) (laughs) So there we go. Okay. So we head into issue two, and we start off once again with the Fearsome Four at Quacker Jack's toy warehouse, and we learn that all of the Fearsome Four were forced into mundane jobs at Quackworks. Uh, and we also, this is where they established that Quacker Jack's personality is a little darker and edgier than the cartoon. Okay. And they, they show this by, he's showing off one of his new toys, and it's a small Quacker Jack action figure, and he uses it to blow up the whole building. And then they walk away, and it's like, cool, guys, don't look at explosions. <laughs> <laughs> they all slide on six shades. <laughs> Except I think maybe okay. uh, Megavolt was looking at the explosion, so I guess he's not a cool guy. No, he, he thinks he is, though, so... Well, who doesn't appreciate a good explosion? Yes, so we cut back to Darkwing Duck, and he has snuck into Quackworks, the building where he works, after dark. And he starts an I Am the Terror line, and his I Am the Classic ro- Rock Act that never retires. But there's nobody there, and he doesn't expect anyone to be there, so I'm not sure why he did that, but I could see him doing that. Yeah, I mean, he's definitely monologued for no reason numerous times. Yes. So Darkwing wants to find out who is behind Quackworks, because apparently nobody really seems to know who it is. So he logs onto a computer, and he asks about the founder, and it shows him a picture of Flounder from The Little Mermaid, and he says, No! I said Founder! Flounder! Okay, so the computer tells him there's no official founder. Quackworks is a creation of like-minded citizens of St. Canard, which is clearly BS. Darkwing is pondering on this when a pair of hands come into view, and then we see a silhouette that is teased to look like Steelbeak. He's wearing, like, the Steelbeak outfit, and, like, the silhouette has a comb, like like Steelbeak's head comb. Mm Mm-hmm. And this is going to be the first of many, many times in this series where they're going to tease a character and it's not that character. And they repeat this over and over again. And I don't know why they do it because it's not funny after like the first time. Yeah. 
But anyways, it's not Steelbeak. It's some random dog face guy, and he thinks Darkwing is the lounge singer they hired for the retirement party of an old employee. And I don't know why they'd be holding a retirement party at night after the why office is they closed. think that Darkwing is a lounge singer? And it turns out Wait. Darkwing is a good singer because he goes up and he sings. Well, we have heard him sing as Elvis and other ones. So there we go. He hasn't lost it. We finally, and this is what gets Darkwing his groove back and he starts his career as a lounge singer and moves on and is able to pay the tuition and get Honker out of indefinite purgatory. Well. Right? Oh, okay. <laughs> Close. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we, return, we return to the Fearsome Four. Quacker Jack is driving this rocket-powered Quacker Jack-shaped vehicle like that's like the shape of his bill and all the others are like in sidecars. And Megavolt asks him why they're the fearsome four. Where's Negaduck? But before he can finish asking, Liquidator and Bushroot get really scared and they silence him and they say, don't mention his name. Seriously, never mention Negaduck. So obviously something has happened. Dun, dun, dun. So Quackerjack takes them to another place called Clint Wacky's Wacky Wonders, which I think is a toy store. And Quacker Jack starts monologuing about his time at Quackworks and how much he hated it and how he had all sorts of great plans, but nobody would listen to him. And this will get addressed in detail later on in the annual called Toy With Me. So that's kind of a hint of what's to come. They, like, legitimately work at this company? Like, they got a paycheck, they had a 401k, or was it more of, like, a prison work program? I think it was a bit of both, and they do talk about what they did at their jobs, which I'll mention later because they do bring it up, but I feel like it was more of a forced labor thing. Okay. So... America! <laughs> so, Quacker Jack okay. wants to get revenge on his boss, who didn't respect his vision, and Megavolt is like, I don't get it. Why are the rest of you helping Quacker Jack with this? And Bushroot says, well, after Quacker Jack gets his revenge, all four of us are going to have a turn to get revenge on our bosses. And Megavolt is very down with that idea. Then they blow up the building again. Uh, the Quackworks building? No, <laughs> no, the toy store they're in. Clint Wacky's oh, Wacky oh, right, Wonders. Right, 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 right. Got it. This so, Wonder Emporium. by this point... All their explosions have attracted the attention of the crime bots. So they show up and they're identifying the fearsome four and they're saying identified and then they name all them off. But they say currently absent Negaduck, leader of the fearsome five. And Quacker Jack goes Mr. Bananas brain. He just starts screaming and he pounces on them and he starts ripping them apart with his bare hands while saying never ever say that name apparently any mention of negaduck has okay. you know driven him off the edge and the other three are like uh bruh you okay <laughs> somebody get uh get him a blanket wrap him in it <laughs> Quack um <laughs> And Cracker Jack, like, I feel like this is, again, to show how edgy he is. There's, like, a panel with, like, the bottom half of his face without his eyes visible, and it's he's making a creepy smile. And he turns around, and he has a new Mr. Banana Brain, and he's made out of, like, he's a creepy robotic version made out of wires and metal. And he's like, Quackworks took away the old Mr. Banana Brain, so he, I made a new one, which is an immediate inconsistency in the plot that you're going to find out about later. Okay. Well, I mean, I am not too surprised that continuity is an issue in the Dark Green Duck comic series. Yeah, and it's bad. It's very bad. Oh. We'll get there. Oh, okay. So, oh. meanwhile, Goslin is at home. She's listening to the news on a... Wait, 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 wait. Before we move on. <laughs> yes. So, have you ever seen a Steve Martin movie called the um, Dead Man Don't Wear Plaid? No. So it's basically they took Steve Martin and put him into a whole bunch of film noir movies. Um, kind of like Kung Pao Enter the Fist, where it's just, you know, one contemporary person in a movie filled with old movies. And he just flies into a rage. Anytime somebody says cleaning woman, he just like slaps women. And, so, and that's immediately where my head went when <laughs> Quacker Jack just 
destroyed things at the mention of negative Stain. It's supposed to be very anyway. mysterious and ominous, like a whole bunch of things have happened since we last saw the gang. And yeah, I mean, they're laying it on really thick. And I mean, I guess I could understand it because if they only thought they were going to have a short run of comics, that they'd be like, "Well, we'll 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 pack it with so much stuff that everybody's gonna be like, what happened?" But it's just kind of like, why did you do it? Oh, yeah, I forgot to mention that. So, yeah, it was initially a four-part miniseries. And then not long after they made the initial announcement, they announced it would be ongoing because I guess the response to the initial announcement was so... People went bonkers, and they realized that they could probably do more than just four issues. And they did. They could probably do a whole run of bonkers. Yeah. Oh. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. You set them up, I knock them down. Go ahead. <laughs> let's let's go back to Goslin, who's at home. Please. She's listening to the news on an old-timey radio, and she hears that the toy stores are being blown up, so she decides that she should go find Launchpad, who is at the Duckburg airfield. She hitch hikes. She literally, actually, it shows her get on a bus. <laughs> uh, okay. I don't know why. They just, they put that in there. So I mean, I guess so that we knew how she got there. So Darkwing is still entertaining the guests at the retirement party, and apparently he's a good singer. We find out that the guest of the evening is someone named Maury Thwackenstein, and he's clearly designed to look like Carl Fredrickson from Up, you know, like the old man. Mm. Mm -hmm. uh, so Maury explains he was part of the original design team that built the crime bots and that he and the en other engineers were mysteriously drawn to Quackworks with some compulsion to build them but they don't know why, and I don't think it's ever explained. Mm, hypnosis. Or plot hooks. Uh, plot hooks that drag you into a plot hole. Yes. Because, uh, like, there's a, there's a couple times in this where they drop a few things, and it's like, but can you expand on that, please? And this is one of them. So apparently all these people were mysteriously drawn to Quackworks. So... Uh, Maury tells Darkwing to investigate the Quackworks hub and he provides him with the security codes because he knows a hero when he sees one. And this is why he's retiring because he's gone completely senile and gives <laughs> codes to lounge singers. <laughs> so Darkwing heads to the hub and we get a scene where he's being chased by guard dogs and guard flamingos. The most deadly of all avians. Clearly, they haven't seen that article. What was that bird that recently, like, broke into, like, an Australian store and it was, like, the deadliest bird on the planet? Cass oh, yeah. It was, like... A, a cassowary yeah. or something? Yeah. Uh-huh. They need one of those. That'll take care of any intruders. Uh, like these shrimp munchers. <laughs> so, we cut to Honker, who is in a prison cell and a disembodied... Does he have a harmonica? <laughs> no. <laughs> Oh, missed but, opportunity. But he's a disembodied voice starts talking to him. The cell door mysteriously opens and a weird dentist chair appears and Honker sits in it with no hesitation. Of course. <laughs> and of course. he's he's immediately bound and gagged. And Honker uh -huh. Honker says out loud that he recognizes the voice and the voice says, There, there, shut up. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. When I initially read this, I thought it might have been Negaduck, because that kind of sounds possibly like something Negaduck would say. Maybe not the there, there, but definitely the shut up. How Russian is this written? How Russian? Isn't Taurus Bulba Russian? Uh, he does have an accent, but it's not written with an accent. I mean, he's got a Tim Curry accent. Tim Curry's accent doing another accent. It's an accent on an accent. It's a Tim Curry sandwich. Continue, please. <laughs> So we get to one of the best lines in the entire arc, and this one always makes me laugh. So Darkwing walks into the crime bot factory, and he sees thousands of them being built. And the first thing he says is, now all those orders I filled for chains and cowboy hats make sense. All this time, I thought someone had a unique way of enjoying the weekend. <laughs> And that later got Ooh. removed when, when they republished this, that last part about unique way of enjoying the weekend, that got pulled. That got pulled along with every single toilet that they had drawn. <laughs> so the crime bots detect that there's an intruder and they attack Darkwing. But before he can really do anything, the thunder quack crashes through and we see Launchpad and Goslin have arrived. 
And Launchpad, Launchpad says, Hiya, DW, how's things? And that's the end of issue two. So, do the crime bots, are they dressed like sheriffs? Sheriffs? Sheriffs, like they have... <laughs> No, they're not. They're not actually wearing cowboy hats. Actually, maybe some of them were, but like I think the regular ones are just regular robots. Okay. But there were. I think there were cowboy hats in that scene. Oh, <laughs> I should hope so. Otherwise, that's a very strange observation to, to not make sense. <laughs> Hi, friends. Future Ange here to let you know that I am ending the episode here because it took us about another hour to get through issues three and four. And that's a lot to listen to in one sitting, especially my voice. So next week we'll post the continuation of this episode, which will conclude the Duck Knight Returns arc of the Boom Studios series. Until then, crime doesn't sleep, and neither do we. See you guys.